Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Welcome to our program this evening, our very rainy day here in Dallas. And it is the strains of freedom, jazz diplomacy, and the paradox of civil rights we have adjunct professor of UNT Dallas and president of the Association for the Study of American Life and History, Dr. W. Marvin Delaney, as well as former principal deputy assistant secretary at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, Rick Ruth. Moderating the conversation is music historian Emily Abrams Ansari. I want to express my greatest gratitude to UNT Dallas and Dr. Bob Mung for partnering with us on tonight's program. We're really excited to continue our collaborations and so we appreciate you, Dr. Mung. Thank you very much. And as always, I wanna thank our council's institutional partners, AT&T, Dallas Baptist University, Dallas College, Harwood International, Haynes and Boone, Hillwood Aviation, Lake uh, Lockheed Martin, NEC Corporation of America, PNC Bank, and Sidley Austin. And if you're not a member of us yet, please join us. We'd love to have you uh, join our community of engaged citizens. You can go to our website at dfwworld.org to see all of our membership options. And then last, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention our council's annual fund campaign is going on right now. It's from division to dialogue, and it's in support of civil discourse, which we need more than ever in our history right now in our country. By engaging with the council, you know firsthand how powerful collective curiosity can be. Help us make an impact you can go to our website to donate. And thanks very much. And now I'd like to welcome our partner, Dr. Bob Mung, president of UNT Dallas to give remarks. Bob, thank you so much again. And nice to have everybody. Thank you, Liz. It's uh, an honor to be here. Um, uh, let me just say that what the World Affairs Council brings to the table is much needed uh, wherever it is uh, available. And so uh, thank you for uh, what you do um, and for uh, promoting civil discourse in, in this country and around the world. Um, it's an honor for me to uh, briefly uh, provide remarks for the strains of freedom, jazz diplomacy, and the paradox of civil rights. Um, <clears throat> The topic of the post-war uh, has always fascinated me. Um, the aftermath of World War II, the calamity it brought down on the world, on humanity itself, carries with it large lessons for all of us. Um, you always wonder how constructive people uh, could bring peace out of a post-war uh, that was uh, rooted in such horrific pain and suffering, really meted out by both world wars. Um, two of my personal heroes, Dr. Ralph Bunch and French diplomat Jean Monnet, played important roles in remaking the post-war. And both, unfortunately, are largely lost to history today. But their legacy lives on through uh, those who keep the flame of their work alive. Uh, and they were optimists, uh, where so many were cynical and self-serving during this period. And they got things done uh, by giving others credit and by being exceptionally competent and courageous on a grand historic scale. Uh, I truly love what they uh, stood for. Uh, I'm very excited about the uh, very uh, unique uh, uh, panel tonight, um, moderating the conversation, uh, and it seems like the, the absolute perfect choice to moderate this is uh, Emily uh, Abrams Unsare, Assistant Dean of Research and Associate Professor of Music History at Western University in Canada. London, Ontario. Uh, her scholarly research, which has won several awards, examines music's 
political usages and engagements across the Americas. And our current projects interrogate Cold War era music in El Salvador and Canada. Her book, The Sound of Superpower, Musical Americanism and the Cold War was published in 2017. Dr. W. Marvin Dulaney, well known in Dallas, is an adjunct professor at UNT Dallas and president of the Association for the Study of American, African American Life and History. He's dedicated his 42 year career to teaching American and African American history. As an emeritus associate professor of history, former interim director of the Center for African American Studies and the past chair of the Department of History at the University of Texas Arlington, he has left a significant impact on academia. Dr. Delaney is currently working on a history of African Americans in Dallas. Rick Ruth is a dedicated builder committed to creating institutions that uphold individual dignity and reject violence and extremism. As a former principal deputy assistant secretary at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs in the Department of State, he has decades of experience in cultural diplomacy. Bruce's innovative approach involves countering disinformation through positively focused cross-border networks and establishing the State Department's first global alumni network. He introduced cultural heritage as a non-political component of American leadership and rescued the summer work travel program. A skilled global diplomat, Ruth is a recipient of the Department of State's Edward R. Murrell Award for Excellence in Public Diplomacy. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Emily Abrams Ansari. Thanks so much to both of you. And uh, thank you to everyone watching for being here. Um, it's an honor to meet um, both of you, uh, Mr. Ruth and Dr. Delaney over Zoom. Thank you for being here. I look forward to our discussion. So I thought we might start uh, just by telling people a little bit about what these jazz tours were so that we're all on the same page as to what, what was happening, how these tours came about. Um, before the Cold War began, um, only classical ensembles were, were funded by the State Department. And the, the jazz tours of, of uh, the 50s and 60s were very much a new thing, right? Could you, could you uh, both tell us a little bit more about these tours? What was the jazz diplomacy program and why did the State Department create it? Perhaps we could start with you, Dr. Delaney. Okay, well, I, I know about them from perhaps a different aspect from uh, Dr. Ruth. Um, you know, jazz became sort of like this universal music form in the 1920s and very popular in the, in the United States. Everybody just loved it. And, and and basically, the idea and the belief was that since everybody loves jazz, particularly jazz musicians uh, like Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie, and of course, eventually people like Quin Quincy Jones, uh, they would be they, the State Department funded these tours because they thought that they would be um, good policy, uh, bring a, a lot of respect and support uh, for for the United States, and, and and in a sense they they were right because everywhere these mu musicians went, they they drew large crowds uh, in, in in France, in Germany, in in Austria, uh, in all of the places you, you know that. Where people wanted to hear the the late the best jazz players and the latest jazz music. Thank you, Mr. Ruth. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in um, the 1950s is when pretty much everything that we think of as the modern world came together uh, in one place. Uh, uh, right at the start of 1950 is when. North Korean soldiers poured across the armistice line in Korea and started the Korean War. Uh, shortly thereafter, 
President Eisenhower was elected to office. Shortly thereafter, Joseph Stalin passed away and President Eisenhower saw an opportunity to forge a new world, the kind he'd thought about while he was Supreme Commander during World War II. But there was also the issue, and you mentioned the classical music, the Soviet Union was very active and very powerful in sending abroad what is what would, in, in layman's terms, high culture, the Bolshoi ballet, classical music, dance, and so forth. And America wanted to counter that, uh, but it wanted to do it in a way that was special and different. And at the same time that the Cold War was upon us, uh, was a key moment, Dr. Delaney can obviously talk more about this, in the civil rights movement. If we think back to the 50s, this is when Rosa Parks bravely refused to give up her seat in a bus uh, and started the Montgomery bus boycott. It's when uh, nine African-American students wanted to attend Little Rock Central High School and huge angry white crowds threatened them. And President Eisenhower was forced to mobilize the 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles, and send them to Little Rock, Arkansas to protect nine children who wanted to go to school. And of course, this made headlines all around the world as it should have, and it made America look very, very bad as it indeed should have. Uh, and so President Eisenhower, who created the United States Information Agency and sort of launched public diplomacy for the United States in the 50s, also looked upon uh, jazz ambassadors as a way to show not only does America have important culture to share with the world, but we have a more complex, different relationship with African Americans, the United States, than just the negative headlines coming out of places like Montgomery and Little Rock. So in other words, it was this kind of interesting mixture of a very particular diplomatic need brought on by the Cold War, I guess, and then kind of a little bit the bad PR, if you will, <laughs> of the civil rights movement, right? And all of the, the bad press that That's was right. getting the United States. That would be a fair characterization? Uh, that was totally exactly late. right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You want to add anything about, about the civil rights context here? Yeah, well, one of the things uh, you will notice uh, that the United States, uh, there were actually people all, already in Europe like James Baldwin and Richard Wright and and of course uh james baldwin was writing these these fabulous essays about the the race question in the united states you know um the fire next time nobody knows my name and and basically they're already in europe but they didn't ask those two those those two individuals to, to represent the united states they indeed uh decided to go with the musicians who would bring you know uh sort of a happy music and um less controversial um, approaches to diplomacy. And, and so indeed it, it, it worked better and, and rather than having a James Baldwin or Richard Wright representing the, the United States in Europe. Absolutely. So how was, how was jazz bound up with civil rights at the time? Because that's kind of the other, if it's a triangle of kind of jazz, civil rights, and diplomacy, like what is that side of the triangle all about? In what way were jazz musicians engaged with the civil rights movement? Well, well, actually, let, let's just say it was twofold. Uh, again, um, I just looked at this book by um, Liz Lisa Davenport, and of course, she <laughs> she focuses on one of the first uh, jazz tours that was done by Dizzy Gillespie in 1956, and of course. Uh, Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie was was not a politician, and of course later on we'd have people like Louis Armstrong who was not a politician. But they were just wanted to play music and and make people feel good, and and, and that is what jazz did. Uh, now later on, in, in the in the sixties, you'll get people like John Coltrane and Nita Simone who are using jazz as a as a method of protest. For example. In, in 1963, after the bombing of the, the four little girls in, in uh, Birmingham, uh, John Coltrane does this famous piece uh, called Alabama. And then, of course, at the, at the later on, during the same period, Nina Simone does this piece called Mississippi Goddamn. 
you know, very critical uh, pieces that were indeed uh, sort of protest music. But you don't get that type of music from Dizzy Gillespie or Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? What do you think this experience was like for the musicians that uh, that got involved with these tours? I mean, these are these are musicians coming from kind of the maelstrom of 1950s America mm -hmm. out into all these different parts of the world, into Europe, Africa, Asia, you know, very different contexts. Mm -hmm. what, what, was their, what was their experience of these tours? I have to say, <laughs> I've read uh, well, the autobiography uh, by Quincy Jones, for example, and, uh, and also I saw a documentary on uh, Louis Armstrong. And, and and to them, uh, they were fun. You know, they got to meet a lot of people. They got to party and have a good time. You know, they, they ran into a few problems sometimes because of the language differences. But once the people saw who they were and that they were these famous jazz musicians, uh, you know, the, the doors were open. You know, the Quincy Jones, I think he does a, his jazz tour uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And... The main thing that he had problems was was keeping the band together because people wanted to quit in, in some instances. Uh, but it, but overall, these these jazz tours, uh, jazz diplomacy was a lot of fun. Um, you know, going to going to various places in the world, meeting people, and and I'll just throw in one other aspect: you know, getting to meet European women. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Ruth, what are, what are your thoughts on this? What about, especially, what, what did it, what, what, what was the, the impact of the tours as the, uh, as the State Department perceived it, especially in some of the more complex countries where there really was an important diplomatic imperative? Excellent, excellent question. Well, the impact was tremendous, as Dr. Blaney indicated. The jazz ambassadors uh, and their fellow musicians were received uh, with huge crowds everywhere. And sometimes they were received with some trepidation by the leaders in other countries, which is a good, they're both good things. If the people like it and some of the autocratic leaders are a little uneasy about the music. And of course, as Dr. Delaney indicated, jazz doesn't bring a language barrier. That was, that's one of the great advantages, as you know yourself, Dr. Ansari, about music, is it leaps over all language barriers and unites people in a kind of immediate bond. It's accessible to all. And uh, jazz was considered quintessentially American. There are a number of kinds of quintessentially American music and blues and gospel, but jazz uh, grabbed audiences in the 50s when it flowered around in the United States and people around the world wanted it. And you know, these, for these artists, these are very skilled, sensitive, professional, well-trained musicians and artists. And they perfectly well understood that when the United States Department of State invited them to travel around the world, that it was trying to use them and the fact that they were African-Americans to make a point. You know, you could call it propaganda and that's fine. We were trying to say, we're not as bad as all the headlines say, look at this. You know, we have great musicians, we, we idolize them. They're important figures in our society and they're African-Americans. That's part of America as well. And, you know, they understood that deal and they were proud to have their music displayed around the world. But they were proud to have it funded by the State Department. It's not easy being a musician and making, making a living with a band and so forth. But they also understood that there was a, if you will, a propaganda angle to it as well. And they handled it masterfully uh, by being their natural selves uh, and speaking their minds freely and playing their music. Mm -hmm. And of course, too, there was a great benefit to them being seen to be speaking freely, um, a propaganda benefit to that, too, right, when when so much of the publicity about the treatment of African-Americans was was terrible, right? Um, so, Indeed. Yeah. And, and it's also, if I may, very important to mention that the 1950s was when a great many colonial, former colonial countries were finding independence, what we now call the Global South. And so in particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia and other countries, they were looking, is the United States the model for us? Is it Europe? Is it the Soviet Union? Uh, and these are a very, these are countries where we wanted to very much show them the United States is not a racist country. 
it has racial issues and problems, but we wanted to make the point that we weren't a, that we were not a country that they should be afraid of or fear that they could follow our democratic model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Delaney, you want to add anything there? Well, um, yeah, but uh, but the proper well, I'll, I'll, let me. I'm trying to form my words here, uh, not to contradict uh, Dr. Ruth, but but to perhaps show at least another perspective that in, indeed uh, you know some of the countries in Africa and Asia, you know, did see the the United States in this negative way. They did, you know, learn about some of the tragedies and atrocities that were taking place uh, in, in terms of, of race relations, and, and and indeed the the jazz musicians who who did these um, uh, jazz the diplomacy tours, you know, and, and many times we we're, were sort of caught in a bind in terms of trying to explain what was going on in the United States. I, I, I again, I mentioned James Baldwin and uh, Richard Wright earlier because they. They, they were both of them were in France, but there were other African Americans, you know, who um, went 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 to Europe. Um, you know, in fact, uh, Malcolm X, of course, does his famous tour uh, in the Middle East and Africa in in 1964. And of course, he indeed presents a, a different perspective from what the the, the jazz artists did. Uh, so much so that the State Department had Carl Rowan, you know, sort of go behind him to sort of counter. Some of the things that he was saying, particularly in in, in his tours in um, North Africa and and in of course uh, in, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. I think this this leads us logically to to the really interesting idea of freedom, mm -hmm. um, which I think is intimately a part of this story, right? Um, the idea that that jazz is the perfect musical articulation of American values, American freedom in particular. Um, do, do either of you want to talk a little bit about that? What is it about jazz in particular that, that so effectively sort of symbolizes what the United States is trying to transmit to the world at this particular moment? Sure. Let, let me, I'll speak first and Dr. Ruth, you can, uh, I hope you'll jump in. Um, you know, jazz, as I said, sort of originates in the 1920s during the Harlem Renaissance, and it, and it is indeed free form music. It, it it has sort of some of the classical elements to it, but basically it's it's free form. It's um, African Americans improvising, uh, improvising uh, constantly on traditional themes and, and melodies. And, and so it represented freedom, you know, the freedom to play the music any way that, that you wanted. At least it, it appeared that way, because obviously there's always a, an, an arrangement in some form, form to it. And, and and basically for African Americans in the 1920s, again, this is the period of the Harlem Renaissance where African Americans were sort of um, claiming their their new identity as African Americans. In fact, there's a movement in the 1920s as a part of the Harlem Renaissance called the New Negro Movement, where they indeed were reclaiming their race, racial identity, celebrating it, uh, identify, identifying with Africa, identifying with um, Southern African American culture and, and and jazz was sort of uh, at at the heart of it. Um, and, you know, we I, I keep mentioning people like Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong, but there's all people also people like um, Fats Waller and Duke Ellington, uh, who who are also very important in terms of the the, the development of uh, of jazz and and particularly the the free form aspect of it the the liberating form of it the improvisation that 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 it, it brought to to music in, in this country i think yeah, dr i mean dr delaney of course is spot on uh the uh one of the most popular shows behind the the iron curtain uh in those days was the voice of america broadcast by willis conover the music hour sometimes called the jazz hour and I should note that uh, the Willis Conover archives are at North Texas University, which is a marvelous thing. But he defined and sort of the U.S. government thought of jazz the way Dr. Delaney described as the perfect model for American unity and diversity at the same time. There was an arrangement. There was a core theme that all the musicians understood. 
and collaborated on, but every individual music, musician could do his own riff, if you will. And that was what we tried to say to the world, America is a great experiment in democracy, but every individual while supporting democracy is free to speak and act and explore it in their own way. Uh, and the, uh, the fact that uh, jazz was a popular uh, culture as opposed, if you will, to high culture uh, was also an important point in sending the jazz ambassadors out because there was a great youth audience out in the world that in many cases was simply not interested in hearing a symphony orchestra. They wanted to hear the latest, most popular music. Today, it might be Taylor Swift and Beyonce. Back then, it was indeed Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie and Betty Goodman. And that was an important part of the jazz ambassadors also. Yeah. And we've got some people in the Q&A talking about that, about how popular, uh, how much they love jazz at that time and how, how popular it was. Yeah, thank you. Um, feel, feel free to add more questions as, as we go. Um, for... <laughs> um, let's just talk about the efficacy of the tours. Um, what are your perspectives on that? What, what were the outcomes, both positive and negative, of, of this um, amazing deployment of, <laughs> of musicians? Uh, Mr. Ruth, maybe you want to go first. Uh, they were hugely popular. Uh, I mean, whether it was, in fact, in the Soviet Union itself, whether it was India, whether it was Thailand, uh, wherever the jazz ambassadors played. They were a huge draw. Crowds loved them. Uh, in many cases, they were idolized. Uh, they were taken on, you know, uh, carried through the streets, as it were, in parade form. Uh, there was a great cheering and applause, and people were glad to be able to have direct contact with what was considered some of the best, finest music in the world today, and something that they all longed for. Now, in some countries, this was purely a a musical phenomenon. In other countries, it was also a, a Cold War phenomenon because we, in fact, were trying to reach beyond the Iron Curtain to audiences in the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union that otherwise had almost no access uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, American messages of any kind, musical or otherwise. And I would like to mention, to build a little bit on what Dr. Delaney said, just this past January, two months ago, um, we had uh, Herbie Hancock in India uh, with a number of other musicians uh, to celebrate the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's visit uh, to India in 1959 as part of his homage to uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador now in India, Ambassador Eric Garcetti, is himself a jazz pianist. Uh, and he played along with uh, Herbie Hancock and his group uh, for Indian audiences just this past month in India. So the State Department has by no means given up on jazz or given up on music diplomacy. Mm -hmm. I, and let me concur that the, the tours were very, uh, very, very successful. Uh, everybody <coughs> had fun. And just as uh, Dr. Rich sort of, or Dr. Ruth sort of alluded to, you know, it gave local musicians in, in, in European capitals and cities the opportunity to play along with so play along with and to accompany some of the greats uh, uh, to you know to come on stage and to to play with them and indeed the the, the artists a, a lot of times would invite the local uh, musicians wherever they were to to play along with them and again the audience then would eat eat, eat it up because it, because it, it represented this uh, this real diplomacy of how music can, can, can bring people together, uh, how music can make people feel, feel um, as, as one and, and, and to feel that they have something in, in common. So yeah, they were very, very good uh, in terms of doing what the United States wanted those, uh, those uh, tours to do. And again, there are sometimes logistical problems because you can imagine with a, a band, um, with, and with all this equipment, uh, trying to go from place to place. Of course, they had uh, roadies, but still, they they did have the the logistical problems of the of uh, instruments just dis disappearing and uh, hotels not being booked properly and so on. But overall, they were successful. 
Mr. Ruth, I'm curious to know more about the State Department's perception of the effects of the tools, because obviously they, they eventually the program was was reduced. And as you say, I want to talk more in a little bit about what 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 uh, cultural diplomacy looks like today. But what was the perception back then um, about uh, whether the State Department, I mean, it, it's clear that everyone loved having government funded jazz concerts in their country, right? But what about in terms of achieving the, the political objectives of the State Department in specific countries and specific contexts? What was the what was the read of that? And of course, I, I understand that probably a whole diversity of opinions, but what, what was the sort of overall perception of that? Uh, excellent. The jazz ambassador phenomenon over the number of years that uh, existed was considered a tremendous success. Every ambassador in every country, every American ambassador in every country where they traveled said, this is the, the best thing we have ever done. You know, we just need to keep doing this over and over and over again. This is what builds relationships, what jumps over the barriers of age, of language, of ideology, of headlines, of regimes. This is people-to-people -people diplomacy at its best. Uh, and, you know, when you're in the State Department and you're a foreign policy analyst and you're looking uh, at how to engage the world, obviously for the benefit of the United States, you have to look at what, is Ameri what are America's natural advantages in the world. The things we're good at, the things that attract other countries to us, what is often called soft power, whether the government participates in them or not. And one of the things that was true then and is true this very day is that whether you love it or whether you hate it, America has the most widespread, most influential popular culture in the world. Uh, and that is a powerful, powerful asset. And it took a while for some straight laced, you know, button down State Department bureaucrats to understand that they needed Satchmo, uh, that everything couldn't be a memorandum and a formal office meeting and an aid memoir. They needed they needed to reach the people. They needed to reach the people with what they wanted. And that was this kind of cutting edge culture. Uh, one of the complications, we can talk more about this if interested, is funding culture with taxpayers' dollars mm -hmm. is dicey in the United States. Always has been. Because many, many Americans, quite understandably, have the feeling that culture is a personal matter. If they like a movie, they go see it. If they like music, they buy the record or go to a concert. But they're not sure that we should take their tax dollars and then decide we're gonna send jazz to the world. The same thing happens today with hip hop or break dancing or rap. Some forms of culture, which some Americans think that's not very good culture. I don't like it. Why should my tax dollars be used you know, to purvey it around the world? Uh, and when I was in charge with, of congressional relations at the State Department, I could guarantee you that every time we put out a press release about uh, rap artists or break dancers going abroad, my phone would ring and some congressional office would want to know why we're wasting taxpayers dollars on that kind of art. Uh, and, you know, so so it still goes on today. It didn't that kind of discussion didn't end when the jazz ambassadors ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, there's like several different layers to those concerns, right? There's the kind of potential concern about whether I approve of the art form. There's also the concern about government being involved in funding the arts at all. Mm -hmm. And then government being involved in putting the arts to a kind of diplomatic purpose. Those are all sort of different levels of potential concern. Like one yep. could one could have with the program. Uh, yeah, interesting. Um, Dr. Delaney, anything to add? To that or any thoughts? No, I'm going to pass on that one. Dr. Uh, Ruth answered that quite well. Yes, he did. It's fascinating. Thank you. Um, just before I move on to what, what, what cultural diplomacy today, uh, we do have a question um, about big bands uh, like the Glenn Miller Band and whether they were considered jazz bands and, and sent on the jazz tours. I don't think they were, were they? Do, do either of you know? No, not not to exactly. the, they were not they were not under the umbrella we think of as jazz ambassadors. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what did uh, what did the U.S. government learn about cultural diplomacy 
during this period, a peak of cultural diplomacy in the 50s and 60s, that that has sort of carried on in today, in, into today, and carries on today in sort of State Department wisdom. I'm, I'm curious um, to hear more about that, Mr. Ruth. Sure. Well, the, the term I used a little bit ago, soft power, is sort of the term that's in in vogue these days. It was uh, coined a couple of decades ago by a Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard. And by soft power, he meant as distinguished from hard power, which is military strength and economic strength and economic sanctions. Soft power are the aspects of a country that attract you to it. I mean, what do we think of when we think of Paris and France? Probably something pretty good. Uh, and we're sort of naturally inclined to have a good feeling about, about France. Uh, I say this very simply, but it's true. We all have images in our minds of what other countries are like. So using values and culture and people-to-people -people programs to project what we think are the best aspects of the United States, while admitting all of our faults and all of our flaws, we can't hide them, we should admit them, we should always talk about them, so it's never to be deceitful, always to tell the truth, but leading with music, and at the same time that the jazz ambassadors were active, there was also ferment in the world of dance and modern, what's called now, then called modern dance. Uh, there was a ferment in the art world. There was even a, a uh, art show created by the State Department who sent to Dallas, Texas and got protests because some of the artists, quote unquote, were communists. Uh, there was a, a famous story. I mean, it, it turns out that after Truman finished being president, he went to France and he actually met Pablo Picasso. And apparently the two of them spent the day together, had a perfectly fine time, although Truman didn't like anything Picasso ever painted. Uh, and when he came, when he and Mrs. Truman came back to the United States, a reporter said, well, Mr. President, uh, are you going to invite Mr. Picasso to the United States? And Truman replied, we don't invite communists to come to the United States. Uh, so, you know, it was, it may seem quaint now, but art and politics were inseparable back then. I mean, sometimes avant-garde, what was then called avant-garde art, was looked upon as something suspect and foreign, still is sometimes today. But the key thing the State Department learned is the importance of human authenticity, human relationships, talking to people about what they care about at their own level, and not just ambassador to ambassador or minister to minister behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me let me sort of add to, too that uh, it, there's it, there's sort of an irony too that uh, they did the jazz uh, diplomacy uh, and and of course mainly trying to show how race relations in the United States were better perhaps than it, it, other places in the world. Uh, I, I actually got to play a role in something similar uh, in 2006. Me and some other scholars, um, you know, uh, went to Brazil. Uh, Brazil was in the process of, uh, believe it or not, enacting an affirmative action program. And so uh, I got called upon, and uh, some scholars, one from uh, Duke, uh, I believe the other was from Georgia, uh, and we went down to, to participate in a conference uh, about affirmative action uh, in, in um, or where we went, San Salvador of all, all places. And, and and indeed, you know, even though I, I'm sure some things got lost in translation, you know, we indeed talked about how affirmative action had worked in the United States. And as of 2006, it's because Brazil was trying to do the same thing. And so they were looking. And so the State Department indeed sent us so-called scholars down there to, to talk about how it had worked in the United States. But I'll say this. Um, Overall, the, the people in, in Brazil were still hostile to any notion that people, because of their skin color, would get some benefits uh, based on past discriminations. But, but again, I, 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 at the time, I thought, well, wow, this is sort of interesting that they're doing some of the, doing this in 2006. You know, after my, you know, learning about the the, the jazz diplomacy tours. And so they're, they're sending, we're, the State Department sending scholars allegedly to help another country deal with the, their racial problems. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I would jump in here just to say that it's important that we never, ever try to hide our flaws and our shortcomings. First of all, the world already knows what our flaws and shortcomings are. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they, they travel here, they read, they visit, uh, and then we talk about it. I mean, again, we read, going back to reading James Baldwin, going farther back to reading W.B. Du Bois or reading anything today. Um, the world knows what America's problems are, whether it's racial issues, whether it's gun violence, whatever it might be, they know that. And so for us to try and pretend it doesn't exist or to paper over it is not only hypocritical, it's fatal to any real dialogue. Because if people think you're lying or concealing something from them when they know better, then you've got no basis for a relationship. So uh, we always have to be honest and straightforward. And one of the things that, that jazz ambassadors and cultural diplomacy, music diplomacy does today is it reaches young people, perhaps along with sports, better than any other kind of diplomacy. Uh, because we all know that if there is an area and it doesn't matter whether it doesn't matter whether it's the favelas of Brazil or the pitons of Morocco, where there are too many young people who don't seem to have a purpose in life, if they're alienated, if they're disaffected, there's going to be trouble or the potential for trouble and unrest. We need to reach those young people. And, you know, as wonderful as I am, sending me out there to talk about the importance of staying in school is not going to ever, it's not going to cut it. Uh, we need to, we need to give those young people something they're looking for. So we send Kareem Abdul-Jabbar out there and we send, you know, the Harlem dance company out there. We, we build an audience by giving young people what it is they want. And then we work into those programs, values of mutual respect and tolerance and, you know, the rights of women and girls and so forth and so on. So, the cultural programs are very much gateway programs. And often when I'll get a call from you know, a member of Congress or a staffer who's upset about some particular music program, if you put it in terms of a gateway program to reach young people around the world, rather than just saying, we love this culture, so you know, you're pro it's too bad for you if you don't like it. Uh, we talk about it as that kind of gateway to reach young people because everyone knows well, young people are the future. They always are. Mm, interesting. So is that the way in which, because I mean, America, American culture is everywhere now, right? And that's, of course, one of the things that has really happened since the, since the jazz tours is there's less and less need in a way for the US government to be involved in, in bringing musicians around the world. Back then, it was an extremely expensive, highly logistically challenging enterprise. And now um, successful musicians, you know, they go everywhere, right? They, they give concerts in Asia like it's nothing, right? Taylor Swift is just flying back and forth across the world like it's nothing. Um, this is just a normal part of a musician, a successful musician's career now. So what is the kind of, what is the, State Department involvement now um, with musicians, what does that add? It, it sounds like it's it's a lot about communicating with young people. But what, what else is, is going on there that's different to just sure. we're putting, you know, Americans are already giving concerts all around the world? Well, you know, it's, it's true, of course, as I said, American uh, popular culture uh, is the most widespread influential popular culture in the world. I mean, I mean, I think everybody will understand I'm exaggerating slightly, but when I say everyone in the world knows about Taylor Swift and Beyonce, everyone in the world has has seen or wants to see Star Wars or Black Panther. I mean, or, or, or you know, Barbie, by the way, Barbie is a fabulous movie. Um, that's all that's all true. But the thing is, that is not a foreign policy. That's a wonderful global phenomenon. But if you're talking about particular countries, particular groups, particular problems, you're not, they, the audience you're trying to reach is probably not gonna be a money-making audience. The profit motive is not gonna help you reach the young people we need to read and reach in the Sahel of Africa or in certain parts of Southeast Asia or the poorer parts of India. We target those audiences in the sense that we identify through our embassies where it would be the most helpful to to reach out with American soft power, with American culture, to these new audiences and help them engage with us, which is the kind of thing that most commercial ventures would not do because there's no there's no profit motive for them. Thank you. And yeah, um, Stacy White, a former cultural diplomat, is just chipping in in the Q and A here to say, yeah, cultural diplomacy. It's it's not just concerts a performer 
and a passive audience that she appreciates you talking about the two-way conversation um, with these kinds of issues. Oh, that's an excellent point. The State Department, I mean, back to the Jazz Ambassadors Day, uh, it was very common for an artist or a group to go abroad, appear on a stage, uh, and then go back to their hotel room. Uh, but we don't use that model of the State Department any longer. Everything is about community engagement, individual engagement, uh, meeting people on their own ground, if you will, community centers and schools, and very importantly, how to make the creative culture work for them. Because one of the com one of the issues we heard, or complaints even we heard, is, well, okay, you sent us a, a musical group and we love them, but now they're leaving. What do we do? You know, what do we now do here in Laos? What do we do here in Sri Lanka now that they're gone? So we now send artists who not only talk about or perform their music or their dance, but talk about how to make a business out of it. How do you make a living being an artist, being a musician, being a dancer? So they help build the creative economy in those countries as well. Thank you. So I have one more question for Dr. Delaney, but I uh, would love to hear some more questions from our audience if any of you want to type them into the, the Q&A. Um, so my, my question for you, um, Dr. Delaney, is, is I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the sort of the lingering effects of these tours, both for jazz and for race relations in the United States. Because I think that it had a kind of a seismic effect on, on both of those things um, that, that kind of in some ways continues, I would, I would think, to this day. Sure. Uh, and, and they have had a, a very lingering effect. So much so that um, not only do the, do the jazz artists uh, continue to go abroad, even without the obviously without the support of the largely without the support of the State Department, they go on their own now uh, because you know jazz uh, R and B uh, and as Dr. Ruth sort of pointed out, American culture is just so powerful and, and popular around the the world and. And everybody wants to take, uh, be a part of it, learn from it, uh, enjoy it, and and so indeed you you get the artists uh, going abroad, and in many cases um, becoming more popular abroad uh, than here in the United States. Uh, of course, one of the aspects of of going abroad, oh, let's say early twentieth century, well. 20, from the 1920s through the 1960s was that the artists it, it indeed felt in some sense, and Dr. Dr. Ruth, you can address this, that they, are, they, were, they were treated better abroad than they were treated in the United States. And so that was a, a, an interesting uh, aspect of, of, of foreign travel for many African-Americans who were, were artists, uh, musicians, and of course, obviously jazz, jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have any thoughts on that, um, Mr. Ruth? Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Delaney is quite right, and I would just add on to it that, of course, we're talking about the United States and the Department of State in the 1950s. So mm -hmm. the American diplomats at the embassies abroad, you may rest assured, were 90 plus percent white males. Uh, and in fact, it was not all that long ago that if a man and a woman who were both foreign service officers, both diplomats, got married, the woman had to resign. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, these are things we're all familiar with now, but we have to take ourselves back to the 1950s. So when these, these great artists went abroad, mostly it was a huge success, but there were times when they ran into American foreign service officers at embassies who frankly themselves were prejudiced or uneasy or very uncomfortable not knowing how to act or be around uh, jazz uh, African Americans, much less you know powerful, thoughtful, articulate individuals. So you know it was a a complete experience, if you will, uh, both good and bad, but educational all around. And I would just say you know we have we we've kept the message of that. Uh, we just sent out a number of groups to the State Department celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Uh, uh, Vice President Harris was just in Ghana with one of the State Department music programs. Uh, the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra just went to China uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of their visit in 1973, which was the first ever Western Symphonic Orchestra to visit China. Uh, and I, I have to mention 
the amount of work the State Department is doing now with Ukrainian artists, musicians, dancers, and so forth, because obviously the Russian invasion is designed to erase Ukrainian identity, including cultural identity. And so we're spending, we have programs which link up Ukrainian artists in all different fields of art with their American counterparts to help support them and continue those Ukrainian uh, national traditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Delaney, we have um, a, a question in the Q&A that pertains to your, brings sort of your, your work on civil rights um, in dialogue with your work in the community. Um, someone, uh, Bethany Dunn is curious to know how has the North Texas business community evolved to become a more inclusive space? And where is it still falling short in terms of inclusivity? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> let's let's just say uh, a lot has happened here um, in the last 50, the, the 60 years to, to, to change North Texas, to change obviously the city of Dallas. Um, you know, we, uh, my research, you know, starts uh, in the early 20th century. And of course, we, we see, you know, segregation and discrimination in all aspects of life, from public um, uh, accommodations to schools to housing. And but since the, the civil rights movement, you know, with the passage of the very Civil Rights Act, the, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act and so on, uh, a, a lot of ch change uh, has happened. And and it and it's obviously it's gotten much better. You can now live pre pretty much any any way that you want to if you have have the money. And there are uh, African Americans who are in all aspects and all levels of government in, in in North Texas. But you know the the I think the main thing that that has not happened in terms of progress is sort of economic development. You know. Um, the the federal government and, the, and local governments, you know, d deliberately uh, restricted the access of African Americans to, to property and wealth, and so that's where African Americans and that, that's that's where North Texas, like but actually most of the country, lags behind in terms of the development of wealth um, among African Americans and, and Mexican Americans. Thank you. Sure. So. Any final thoughts, um, just to close our, our discussion of the, the jazz tours, anything that we've left out that we should have mentioned? Mm -hmm. Dr. Delaney, please. I was gonna say, uh, I've enjoyed learning about the sort of the workings of the State Departments and, and how the State Departments uh, put these tours together and, and, and their sort of impetus and uh, rationale for doing them. That's, uh, that's helped me in terms of of uh, my own research and teaching, uh, and it gives me a different perspective on them. And so I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Ruth. Well, I would just like to, I would like to close on a very positive note, something that happened just recently that shows the continued power of music diplomacy just down the road from you all. By the way, I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. Just down the road from you uh, in is the 10th Congressional District, Representative Michael McCall of Texas, a Republican is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, so you can imagine that the Republican chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Secretary of State for the Biden administration don't always see eye to eye on every foreign policy issue. But here's something they do see eye to eye on. So at the end of last year, in the State Department's main you know, reception room, uh, with Representative McCall sitting in a chair just 10 feet away, Secretary of State Antony Blinken got up on stage, picked up his black Stratocaster guitar, and he played Hoochie Coochie Man by Muddy Waters, uh, while Chairman McCall applauded. So that is not only a testimonial <laughs> to music diplomacy, that's an example of the power of music diplomacy to bring people together. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> for, for that story. I think we could use a lot more uh, musical diplomacy in our own country these days with the division and polarization that we have. And and uh, thank you for this really thoughtful, interesting conversation. We really appreciate everyone on the, the panel, the, the conversation tonight. So thank you for your insights and expertise. And everyone, we appreciate you joining us please do check out our website. And I just want to thank Dr. Bob Mung and UNT Dallas 
uh, and UNT for uh, partnering tonight. Thank you to everyone. Have a good night and see you next time.